and we're good to go. Okay. Welcome to the Salt Lake City Planning Division appeal hearing for February 15th, 2024. We have two matters that are listed on the agenda tonight, but the first matter um, we will no longer be hearing that appeal has been withdrawn in matter PLN APP 2023-00906. My name is Mary Woodhead. I'm the appeals hearing officer tonight. Um, we have one matter on the agenda. It's uh, land use appeal, appealing the planning commission's denial of a design review approval in matter PLN PCM 2023-00707. I understand that Bruce Baird will be presenting for the appellant and Paul Nielsen will be presenting for Salt Lake City. I will um, let you know that I've read all of the materials. I've listened to the Planning Commission hearing, um, and I've looked at some of the cases and the ombudsman opinion cited by the various parties. The way we'll go forward is I will hear from Mr. Baird first for the appellant, then I'll hear from Mr. Nielsen, and finally, I'll give Mr. Baird a last chance to um, respond to anything the city offers. And if anyone has anything they need to say, either of the parties, I certainly would like to hear it. So given all of that, um, Mr. Baird, would you like to start? Absolutely, and thank you. And uh, first of all, I wanna thank Amanda for an excellent staff report. It's just too bad that the planning commission decided not to listen to her and decided to make what I believe to be the most unsupported and unsupportable decision I've ever heard in any land use context in my 20 something years of experience. Let's start with why it's illegal to begin with, not just arbitrary and capricious. It's illegal for the following reasons. Here is the record of decision uh, which, of course, is complete. Amanda made one mistake and one mistake only, as far as I can tell in this case, and that is the first sentence of this review process. The Planning Commission made specific findings related to the standards for design reviews as stated in 21A59 of the City Code. Unfortunately, Ms. Roman is 100% wrong. If you listen to the tape, the word findings does not appear. Uh, no one makes any findings ever anywhere. The motion consists of essentially one sentence, and that sentence, as I'll point out later, cites entirely the wrong code, yet another reason it's illegal. Of course, Utah case law is very clear that because a, a decision has to be reviewable by a district court, there has to be something to review. You have to state what your findings are, and you have to support them by substantial evidence. Now, we can talk about the silliness of the substantial evidence decision in a minute, but the clear, the clear fact is you have to make findings and you have to back the findings up by evidence. And I trust that the city will stipulate that the word findings was never used. It was never used in the motion. There's no findings in the staff report supporting a motion to, de to deny. Uh, so that's the first issue. There's no findings. Second issue is that Ms. Shear, when she made her motion, simply cited the wrong statute. She may have cited it how she wanted it to read, but it's not how it reads. And it's specifically the statute that she references in her motion. And I have the, if I can find it, I'm actually working on a different, not my normal computer, uh, because I've got a Zoom problem. But this is, can you see the Zoom screen, the Planning Commission screen? Yes. All right. This is queued uh, essentially to the motion. I'm, I'm 15 seconds at the wrong part of the motion. Second. This is where the motion dies, the to approve dies for lack of second. This is Ms. Shear's motion. an alternative motion then. Mr. Chair. 
I move that the commission deny the Suzanne review application because evidence has not been presented that demonstrates the proposal complies with the following standards. 21A 59.050 part A, uh, which is the intent of the downtown district to provide uh, use bulk, efficient use of space, urban, high urban density and very intensiveness. And also because it is also on a public investment that is planned called the Green Loop here, I believe that we should have a lot of intensity, but that's not part of the motion. Sorry, it's just yeah. second. So she dropped off the uh, Green Loop issue and went solely with the 59.5 issue, uh, 59.050 issue. The problem is she can't read the statute. This is what 59.050 actually says. Any new development shall comply with the intent of the purpose statement of the zoning district and specific guidelines, design regulations found within the zoning district in which the project is located, as well as the city's adopted urban design element and adopted master plan policy and design guidelines, et cetera. Not a word of what she said is in that design standard. And she fact, actually, if you take a look at the actual design station, design standards, for the downtown district as a whole, and for this downtown district in specifics, here they are because I quoted them. This is 30010, which is the downtown districts as a whole. It talks about the downtown districts in terms of use, bulk, urban design, et cetera. I highlighted every one of these actual substantive things in different colors as a way of parsing the sentence out to talk later about what the substantial evidence is uh, the uh, the other issue is the design, the central district district. Yeah, excuse me, the central business district D one purpose statement, which is O two O A, which is the one that would technically control. And you can read that on the screen. And again, she has that completely wrong and didn't even bother to get the right citation. Uh, so there's that's why this is illegal for two reasons. There's no findings, and she's citing the wrong statute. To begin with, uh, the third reason that this should be overturned is that she said, and I quote, there is no evidence. That's ridiculous. Ms. Roman's staff report is replete with evidence to the issues of enhancing employment opportunities because of the jobs and the businesses, encouraging the efficient use of land because of how uh, we're, we're getting the uh, missing middle enhance property values because we're building a new building, improve the design quality of downtown areas. And I want to stop on that one for a second, because Ms. Woodhead, if you listened to the tape, you heard, of course, several of the planning commissioners, including commissioners who voted against this project, express why the project was absolutely stone cold beautiful, why the downtown mid-block walkway was wonderful. All they said was, oops, we don't think that the city should be able, that there should be an exception here. They completely wrote the exception out of the code. And I'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, uh, Mr. Baird, Bruce. Um, I mean, the city's ordinance says 100 feet is the minimum and the project is less than 100 feet. So this is an exception. Correct. So remember that you're talking to me in that context. I understand that. And I'm going to get to that. I promise you that it's right here. So I will get there. I'm, dissect, I'm dissecting the statement because the city has the burden of proof in denying this use to comply and state the reasons therefore. And there's innumerable Utah cases saying they have to do that. Davis County, Wells versus Board of Adjustment. There's, a, there's numerous cases that say they have to do that. I'm sure that Mr. Nielsen will agree that the city has the burden of articulating the basis for any denial. This in, to the contrary, for the basis for the denial, the staff report was replete with basis for approval. Not one single person in the planning commission said anything against these specific design criteria. Every single mention of an, a negative recommendation were two things and two things only. One was it would supposedly set a precedental value, a statement. Which is there a, was one commissioner who said that, and that wasn't part of any. I'm, I'm getting. You know, I, so. I promise you, I'm going to get to that. I've read this. I, I promise you, Mr. Nielsen gave that up in his memo correctly. 
and and rightly that Ms. that it was not in the memo and more than one said it actually three said it but it doesn't matter the point is we have all it wasn't the basis for any decision i i understand that but it certainly looked like it if you heard the memo and you read uh you you read some of the discussions so that's why i addressed it uh so we 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 can give up on precedent the question is is there substantial evidence justifying the diminution of the height. And I'm going to get to that because that is reviewed actually not under the design standards for 050, which Ms. Uh, Shear got wrong, or 01, it's reviewed under 010 and 020, but it's really reviewed under the design review statute because these are the standards that have to be met. And all of these are met. And frankly, all of them are absolutely stone cold excellently addressed by Ms. Roman in attachment F to the staff report, where she goes through every single one of these issues about how you review something and establishes beyond any doubt substantial evidence why the design review standards are met. So we're looking at three different purpose statements and three different sets of structures. My point is Ms. Shear missed all three of them. She didn't address the design review standards, which Ms. Roman actually addressed quite wonderfully. She didn't address the proper purpose statement in either 050 or 010 or 020. If you look at the purpose statements in 010 and 020, as I've highlighted them, every single one of them has substantial evidence in Ms. Roman's staff report. If the staff report from the Planning Commission is not substantial evidence per se. I don't know what is. And frankly, there was no evidence to the contrary in that hearing. The only, the, the closest thing that came to evidence of anything to the contrary in the entire hearing was to comparing this site to Worthington. That is the entirety of the neighborhood comparison that some, a few council members excuse me, commission members, as they were discussing the item, said may not have met the character. Every other discussion was very simple. And the very simple is minimum is 100 feet. Therefore, we're saying this should be 100 feet. Now, I don't know they said it because of precedent. That's not an issue here, but that was really one of their issues all the way through, and it poisoned the decision. But the other thing they said is, we're just not going to, we're going to ignore building approved through the design review process. They didn't bother to discuss in their findings or their motion or anything else, a single one of these design review standards up here, despite being, as I said before, extremely carefully guided through them by Ms. Roman in a staff report. Sorry, my camera is not going to focus it, but you have it. It's attachment F. And there's also attachments. Uh, yeah, there's an, another attachment which went through all of the other uh, issues, and that's attachment. Uh, it's pages 91 and 92 of the staff report. The attachment F is at pages 105 to page 113. And again, the staff report, by definition, has to be substantial evidence. Uh, and no, I don't have a case that says the staff report is substantial evidence, but I can't believe anybody would argue the contrary. So let's talk about the design review in the, the purpose statement of the D1 Central Business District, a broad range of uses. Well, we've got ground floor retail. We've got a walk through uh, a walkway, which the planning commissioners all complimented. Uh, there's an it's a walkway big enough to actually be activated. Uh, with a distinct plans for activation as opposed to some other walkways. It includes very high density housing. There's no doubt about that. It's certainly intended to foster 24-hour activity consistent with our various function. It's intended to be very intense with high lot coverage. It's essentially 100% lot coverage, except for a tiny little bit of open space in the walkway. So that's met. It's got large buildings. I don't think anybody can describe a seven-story building as not a large building that is placed close together, clearly that's met, while being oriented toward the pedestrian with a strong emphasis on safe and attractive streetscape. Everybody, everybody explained how much they love this design 
and it preserves the urban nature of downtown. Uh, so that's how it meets the central business district. I've already gone through how it meets the 010, which is the general downtown provisions. It encourages the efficient use of land, seven stories. It's only 13 feet, otherwise known as one story, less than 100 feet. And the reason for that is the obvious answer of design costs. Once you go from two, five over two to steel, it increases the cost, as there was made clear in the record, by about a foot, which discourages the missing middle of housing, which we desperately need in this state. I would point out that two of the planning commissioners manifested their own absolute ignorance in noting how to calculate and consider the value of housing and the cost. One of them just didn't understand it at all and admitted it. The other one tried to say that if you went higher, you'd get more units and therefore the price would go down, not understanding that those units are also in the square foot price of steel, et cetera, so the price doesn't go down. This creates a unique downtown center because we've got this wonderful mid-block walkway. It encourages permitted residential uses within the district, and it certainly helps to ad implement the adopted master plans for the area. Again, all of those things were carefully laid out in Ms. Roman's staff report. The planning commission simply ignored everything except two things, one of which they've now given up, and that is the precedential value. The second thing they said was there's no substantial evidence and clearly there was substantial evidence. Let's talk about the other issue for a second because I focused entirely on height. But remember there were four, there were three other uh, special exceptions sought. One of those was for the length of the facade. And as far as I could tell, every single member of the planning commission thought that the length of the facade was wonderfully broken up by my client's design, as again explained by Ms. Roman in her excellent staff report. The other two issues were the glass on top and on the bottom, and I can't remember what the four, oh yeah, the, uh, the upper four is having the setback, step back. On every single one of those, there was literally, I take it back, there was discussion about the glass, and it was adequately explained by Ms. Roman's staff report by my clients, and no one really questioned it on the planning commission. And certainly there's no findings uh, regarding that one. The third one, the fourth one is the step back, and that was essentially not ever discussed during the planning commission meeting. And again, Ms. Roman's staff report is sufficient, substantial evidence to support it. And there is no evidence to the contrary, and there are no findings to the contrary. So as I've indicated, this is both illegal in that it doesn't have findings, and, in, and that's clear. There's no question about that. Second, she cites the wrong case law, the wrong statute. Third, when you look at the right case, the right statutes, then it clearly meets it. Fourth, the Planning Commission's decision essentially ignores and writes out of the code the actual fact of why we were at the planning at the design review to begin with. Fourth, the Planning Commission didn't bother to address the design review standards in any way, despite being guided correctly. Fifth, that's that's the illegality issues. Uh, on the uh, arbitrary and capricious issues, the Planning Commission says there was no evidence, which means they utterly disregarded Ms. Roman's staff report. You cannot utterly disregard the staff report. I used to say that people that the definition of substantial evidence, which we all know what it is, unfortunately, doesn't mean what normal humans think it means. It means that evidence which is standing alone would allow a reasonable person to come to the conclusion. I usually say that that is, a, is met unless somebody says the sun comes up in the West. In this case, Ms. Roman's staff report clearly shows the sun coming up in the East and the Planning Commission just decided to not consider it in any way and pretend that the sun came up in the West, therefore effectively writing subsection E out, which fails both on the illegality and the arbitrary and capricious test. And I don't have anything else. Okay, thank you, Mr. Nielsen. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, I, I kind of got lost in the, the metaphor of the, where the sun's coming up, but uh, I don't think that that's um, really uh, relevant. Um, Normally, Mr. Baird starts off by saying I'm going to be brief, and so I guess I'm going to take that path this time. Um, appreciate that you read the briefs. Appreciate that you uh, looked at the case law. Um, 
one thing I wanted to point out from the case law. Sorry, I've got many, many screens open here. Um, in the in the price case, uh, if you're looking at 995 Pacific Second, it's on page 1246. Um, and this is talking about the effect of a purpose statement or the, the intent of a code. Um, and this, this case is a little bit weird in that it wasn't per se a land use. It was about um, incentives, tax incentives uh, for a developer. And what the court in that case said was uh, to determine whether this language amounts to a statutory limitation on the uses to which sales and use tax revenue can be put, we consider its context within the local sales and use tax act. And those, those four words, we consider its context is really important because the court did go on and say purpose statements are generally unimportant. They can help guide us when there's an ambiguity, but, um, uh, but, but the language is very important. We consider its context. And in this case, you have an ordinance that says as a substantive standard, you need to look at the purpose statement in the zoning district in which you're seeking um, the design review approval. And let me uh, interrupt you, and I don't mean to turn this from an argument into a conversation, but I think Mr. Baird kind of stepped away from his argument that the purpose statements are irrelevant. Rather, he's now arguing that the wrong purpose statements were um, sure. considered. And I'll, I'll address that in just a second. I just wanted to shore that up because I, I okay. think it's, I've, I've made the argument in these appeal hearings that, yeah, there's, there's case law there that says that the impact of a purpose statement is, you know, <laughs> this, this little, it's, it's not generally significant, except in this case it is. And I appreciate um, you identifying that Mr. Baird hasn't really hammered on that. So first he said that um, this, this decision was illegal because there were no findings. Uh, I would disagree with that in that the finding was that there um, was no proof. Sorry, I'm trying to get to the right page here. Uh, too many screens. Um, there we go. Uh, the the there is a finding. That was the second thing. Is that there's there's no findings, right? There's um, the the finding is that it, the proposal did not meet the intent of the downtown district to provide use bulk, efficient use of space, high urban density, and uh, intensiveness. Um, that that's the finding. Uh, that's the commission's decision. That's the basis. Um, the argument about Commissioner Shear using the wrong citation. Uh, I think that we can give her a little bit of leeway for uh, not uh, being a practitioner of accurate citations. These are lay members who um, serve the city and uh you know for her not to to actually say well we're looking at 2159 uh 21a59 uh 010a which then points to 21a30020a uh, that's what she was getting at she was talking about the requirement in the design review standards to look to the purpose statement in the district which she did not cite 21a 3020A, but that's what she said. It's the purpose statement. It's what the design review standard points to. That's where she went. And the specific, uh, the specific items in that purpose statement about bulk, height, efficiency of use, whatever, um, match up with, uh, with what's in the, per sorry, what, what she stated in her motion matches up with what's in that purpose statement. So I think this is a red herring argument about the wrong citation. Um, now on the, the issue of substantial evidence, Mr. Baird says that Ms. Roman's staff report provides substantial evidence um, of uh, th that would support a design uh, review approval. And I agree with him if that's what the planning commission had done, that is substantial evidence had they approved that. But that argument 
assumes that every time a staff report is presented to the planning commission, they will agree with it. They have to agree with it. There, that there may not be any contrary substantial evidence. And that's just not the case. It, 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 no land use decision could operate that way. It would give way too much power to the staff. And Ms. Woodhead, you've seen several times a planning commission has gone in a different direction than the staff recommendation. And there is substantial evidence um, on the other side. There's substantial evidence to, to both support and deny. The planning commission gets to determine whether uh, this met the, the requirements. Now, Mr. Baird points out that the, the commission didn't issue any findings on all of the other standards for design review. That's correct. As you know, and you read case law, you'll see that courts will often say, we're not going to reach that issue because what we do find sort of makes all of the rest of that irrelevant. And that's what the commission did here because they just decided that this bulk height intensity of use um, was basically disqualifying for the entire application. If it didn't meet that requirement, there was no point in finding the rest of, I mean, and, and Mr. Baird was right. They, they were uh, making complimentary statements about the mid block walkway and about other aspects of the proposal. And I think that had they not determined that 21 and a half feet of height deviation was just too much, then they probably would have approved it because they, they did have, uh, they did reflect some uh, positive thoughts about the development overall. But the fact is that the code was recently amended to uh, make it clear that the city wants taller structures in the D1. And this was just too much of a deviation. And that's why the commission said, you're not meeting that purpose statement in 21A or of the D1 district. They didn't cite it. And I don't, again, I don't think a wrong citation or uh, a lack of a more correct citation to the D1 purpose statement is, is a, a problem here. Um, and that's all I've got. It's okay. Mr. Burden's yeah. proof. It's, it's Mr. Baird's burden to prove that the commission erred. It was the applicant's burden to prove that they met the standards and the commission didn't feel that they did. I'm, I'm, first of all, I, I always love dealing with Paul because of his intelligence and his candor, which is lacking, I think, a little bit this time, unusually. First, I'm not giving up on Prince. Uh, I, I think the Prince case is still valid. And I don't think merely because you pyramid a vague policy statement into a substantive rule means that you have to look at it. The reason I focus- So wait, I, I wanna stop you there because I think that's important. I mean, I think the argument you made at the beginning of this hearing stepped away from the Prince argument and the ombudsman argument to the extent that in, the, in that piece of your letter, your brief, you said you can't go to a purpose statement where it's not attached to anything and it's just general. It's the ordinance is what counts. I, and I here we have a situation where the ordinance specifically references the, those statements of intent and purpose. And then in your argument, you've gone on and explained why, in fact, they didn't abide by those statements of intents and purpose. So you've actually argued that those are important. No, I haven't argued that they're important at all. What I've argued is that if Mr. Nielsen is right, that you can backdoor incorporate policy statements by a substantive reference to include them in a substantive provision, then he still loses. That's my argument. It's an okay. argument in the alternative. It's a classic lawyerly argument in the alternative. If he's right, he's still wrong. Okay. <laughs> it's that simple. He's wrong for the, for the policy reasons even if the policy reasons count. And he's wrong for the reasons that I articulated. It, I wanna make it clear that it wasn't just Ms. Roman's excellent staff report, which only had one word wrong as far as I could tell uh, in it. It's not her excellent staff report that I'm relying on entirely. There was testimony from my clients. My clients had a submittal 
explaining what the bases are. It is impossible to listen to that hearing and not determine that the Planning Commission really, really, whatever Ms. Shear said, made its decision on two things. Number one, precedent. Now, they've given it up, and I'm happy they have, but listen to the tape. It's about 20 minutes of, of BS. Second, that... Be a little this, bit respectful of these people. They're volunteer planning commissioners. Ms. And Shear, whether Ms. they're Shear, right or whether they're wrong, they Ms. just a little Ms. bit Shear, more respect Ms. than Shear, that. Ms. Shear is an architecture professor, or used to be an architecture professor, who's been on the Planning Commission for ages and has been lectured repeatedly on training for these kind of things and how to do it pursuant to state law. So I, I, I give some deference to that, but my point is not only is Mr. Nielsen's argument throwing Ms. Roman's staff report not under the bus, he's throwing it under the trash can. He's saying that they are 100% entitled to completely ignore all of her testimony because there is no contrary testimony. 100% ignore my client's testimony because there was no contrary testimony. If you look at this hearing, there was no opposition. There, The only opposition was Ms. Shear, frankly, and a couple of other planning commissions who were concerned about precedent and the fact that they just want tall buildings and they think that's all the city wants. The problem is, the code specifically says that you can do it through the design review process. So you have to not just look at, and again, I'm repeating myself, but I want to make sure that I'm clear. You can't not, you can't just look at the standards in 30020, 30010, or 59050. You have to look at 5910, which explains how you go through a process. And in the process, the Planning Commission never bothers to address those issues of how you went through that process. I, I, it's kind of clever of Paul to say that they made a finding. They just made a finding that there was nothing to make a finding on. Uh, it, it, there, that reminds me of that old see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. They did not address a single substantive issue. If this goes to the court, all I have to do, I believe, is show the staff report and say it's substantial evidence and my client wins. The problem with that is I don't want to go to court. And the reason I don't want to go to court is because this property is in, this is off outside the record review. This property is in an opportunity zone. Opportunity zone regulations expire this spring, this summer. If I have to get this property done, then we're not going to go to court on it. We're not going to win. Imagine the situation my clients are in. They've been designing a property for one height, and then the city comes in out of the blue. They're not fully vested. The city comes in out of the blue, changes the standard, makes them redo it. They come in and meet the standards according to the staff report, and that's, then it's ignored, and the planning commission goes its own merry way. Paul's ad horrendum argument that if you have to believe the staff report, then no one will ever beat a staff report is simply wrong. And he knows it's wrong. And the reasons it's wrong is because you usually have, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh, I know, contrary evidence. In this case, there was no contrary evidence. I've beaten staff reports all the time. And I'm happy. That's what I get paid to do is to beat staff reports in many ways or to engineer a favorable staff report. In this case, I couldn't have engineered a more favorable staff report than what Ms. Roman wrote, with the exception of dropping the word precedent out of it. Uh, and that's the only error in her staff report. Other than that, she specifically addressed the design standards in all of the applicable codes. The, the D1, the general downtown districts, and the design review. She addressed every single one of them. Planning Commission addressed absolutely none of them. No opponent addressed any of them. There's no contrary evidence. The staff report in that situation, if standing alone as the only evidence, has to convince a reasonable person. You just can't ignore Ms. Roman's staff report. And that's what the city tried to do, is utterly ignore the staff report out of paranoia for precedence, which clearly drove the decision, and a slavish determination to use the word minimum without recognizing the option for the express option for a design review diminution. And I don't have anything else to say. 
So let me ask you this. So let's presume the planning commission had been more articulate. Could they have said simply in this location, we think that the density provided by height is so important that it outweighs the all these other design benefits? If they'd had some evidence to back that up, I think that's probably true. Uh, or it's possible anyway. If I think they had to address the standards. The, the, there's a reason you put standards in codes is that so courts can review the facts and the determination against those standards. And the court here and you, frankly, have no evidence of to apply to these standards. Not a single one, unless you believe, Paul, that says... There ain't nothing here. Just pretend there's nothing here. Don't, who are you going to believe, me or your lion eyes? Okay. Anything else from anyone? Don't think so. Okay. I, I, by the way, I will miss Paul. This is his last land use hearing. Uh, and uh, I, I will miss him. I hope to see him at the airport. I'm uh, at the but, airport now. Yes. And oh, interesting. That's exciting. I, I hope to see him at the airport, not under bad circumstances at the airport where I've done something that causes me a problem uh, <laughs> with the airport. But I, I will miss him dramatically as the city attorney on behalf of these cases. And Mary, I think this is when, this is about the clearest case I've ever seen in my entire life. Okay, well, I'm going to take it under advisement. I hope to have something in the next couple of weeks. And Thank I really you. appreciate the work everybody put into this. Thank you so much. And have a good rest of your evening. Talk to you later. Thanks. All right. Thank you for your Bye. time.